Morning, church. Today we're reading from Colossians 4, verse 2 to 6. Devote yourselves to prayer. Be watchful and thankful. And pray for us too, that God may open a door for our, our message, so that we may pro- proclaim the mystery of Christ, for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. Be wise in the way you act towards outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. I might have. Oh, there we go. Well, good morning. You brave the weather. Good to see. Uh, good to see Common and Jono back. I'll just say it right off the top. Yeah, welcome back. Um, you you made it through. So I unloaded some stuff from the container, and then there was just this huge downpour, and I was like, "All right." <laughs> anyway, let's. Uh, one thing before I start is uh, on the seventeenth of July, we're going to have a leaders meeting, but we're going to open that up to everybody because it's going to be more about our uh, upcoming move um, to Excelsior College. So we're going to be holding our Sunday services at Excelsior in August. So uh, starting probably August 21st, uh, that's our target date for that. So we're going to have a leaders meeting on the 17th of July after the service, um, kind of like right after the service, so, um, so we can answer some questions and, um, and probably, yeah, just have more of a conversation around that. So um, it's open to everyone. Cool. Let's, um, let's pray and then... Let's begin. Father, we thank you, God, that you are in our midst, Lord, to draw us to yourself, to conform us more into your image. Um, Lord God, I thank you for what you've been already speaking through the songs and through uh, what Sam has shared, and Lord, that you are already speaking this message. And so, Father, prepare our hearts um, to receive everything that you want to say in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Um, This is the final sermon in the Colossians series. And if I was going to do this Colossian series all as one sermon, this is what it would be. It would be the greatness of Christ, Christ in you, the hope of glory. I'm willing to suffer for you so that you will get this. Your love no matter what. So put on a new person. Put on the tender mercies, kindness, and humility. And live like this to your whole family, authentic, steadfast, and spirit-led. That would be the subtitle to the Colossian ser- series. Sermon, but we're now in the final chapter of Colossians, and so it will only be authentic, steadfast, and spirit led. But if you were here, then some of this I hope was kind of like, Yeah, I remember that. I remember that. I remember that, right? So we talk about the greatness of Christ, and then how Christ in you is the hope of glory. Um, that this isn't just, um, just about believing or a mental assent to a truth, but this is about living this out with the Holy Spirit of God in you. Um, that your love, uh, no matter what, so put on the new person, right? Putting on that new person and living in that out every day. Um, and that means it, it parenting as well. Um, and that journey of going, oh man, what does it look like to put on kindness and humility with my interactions with my kids and with my spouse and with, uh, at work? And how do, what does it look like to put on the new man every day? Not just in church or not just after church where it's easy to do that. What does it look like to put on that new person every day when it's difficult to do that? And then Andy shared last week about that putting on that new person in your family life and what that looks like to... Um, to do that, and I, and I love that word, um, should be on, no, it's not, still not, I'm having trouble, there we go, um, so yeah, to put on these new th- things, and then, ah, this isn't working, next slide, and then Andy shared uh, this word, hypotestate, right, remember that? I think that's how he pronounced it too, probably. Um, to voluntarily arrange yourself under, right? To put somebody else's needs before your own needs, right? That's that word, hypothesesta. And it comes from this next word. Let's see if this works now. All right, great. It comes from this word, hypotas, hypos, hypo, whatever, hypotasso, 
which means to put somebody under submission. But see, this word that Paul uses is to voluntarily arrange yourself under. And this was brand new in the ancient world. This word, this is kind of like Paul going, I want you to voluntarily do this. What, what was normally a word that was used for when you conquer your enemy and you put somebody under your feet. Paul is saying, I want you to actually choose to do this. To which his audience would have gone, what? <laughs> right? His audience would have been really like, whoa. Like this would have been, if there were visitors in church when Paul shared this kind of message, they would have just been like, wait a minute, this isn't how we live. This isn't our culture. It's not our culture to, to voluntarily arrange ourselves under uh, somebody else. But see, this is the message of the cross. This is when Jesus washed the disciples' feet. This is when He went to the cross. This is when He called His disciples. This is what everything that Jesus did was, was, was this example of voluntarily arranging yourself under somebody else. And so today when we come to chapter 4, this is already our foundation that we've laid for this chapter. Right? We've already been putting on the new man, putting on this... this uh, this list, right? Compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, patience, bearing with one another, forgiveness. We've already put this stuff on. Love above everything else put on love, right? We voluntarily arranged ourselves under others. And now we come to chapter 4 where he says this, continue now steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. You know, uh, this, this book of Colossians is um, it's a convicting book when you're preparing to preach it, right? I think, I think everybody should prepare at least one sermon in your life. I, I think that would be a really good practice because those of you who have are nodding, you know, because you're like, yeah. Because when you start to prepare a sermon, you start to read this and you're like, oh, yeah, so I have to tell you, to continue steadfastly in prayer. But then I have to look inward and go, hmm, what is cons- ooh, steadfast in prayer? What does it mean to be steadfast in prayer? Right? You've got to be honest with yourself then and go, am I steadfast in prayer? Can I get a show of hands? Who's steadfast? In- yeah, it's a convicting verse, right? It's like a, ooh. Right, what does it mean to be steadfast in prayer? One of the first things I think of is, there's two people I think of first. Reese Howells, uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of him. He was an intercessor and he wrote this book. Uh, I don't know if he wrote it or somebody wrote about him actually, but it's called Reese Howells Intercessor. And, uh, and it's a really convicting book. There's everything this guy did in his life was intercession. It was just prayer. Like every day of his life, he was just one of these radical, all-out guys. And then, the second person I think of is John Wesley. Um, Because John Wesley, his practice, his general practice in life, was to wake up at four in the morning and pray from four until eight before he started his day. Now, he's one of these weird people who don't need sleep, right? Apparently. Because if I were to establish that practice in my life, I don't know how well that would go because I'm not one of those people who don't need sleep. I need sleep. But John Wesley used to pray from 4 a.m. till 8 a.m. And somebody asked him once, how do you find time? How do you have time to pray for four hours a day? And he's like, my life is so packed that I need four hours before I can even start it. I need four hours in prayer before I can even start my day. It's like, what? So if you compare yourself, comparison's the enemy, by the way, but if you compare yourself to John Wesley, you'd be like, oh man, I'm not steadfast in prayer, am I? Oh, right? If you compare yourself, well, here's the problem. You just compared yourself, right? Comparing yourself, that's, that's death, man. Like, I've never seen that work out well for people. Unless you compare yourself to somebody who prays less than you, and then you're like, no, I pray more than them, right? But that is also death, right? So don't compare yourself. This is what what we're going to be doing uh, in the next life group study that hopefully all of you are going to go through. And if you don't have a life group, 
uh, ask me about it because we'll form groups just for you. What we're going to be doing in life groups is this shape, um, discovering your shape, right? And the whole idea of this is that you stop comparing yourself to others and you just start discovering how God has created you. And so, and, and, and the more that you discover how God created you, the more you'll go, okay, so steadfast in prayer for me looks like this. Right? So it won't be, oh, because, you know, what, what it looks like for me is different than Jess. It's different than Sam. It's, it's different than you. Right? So, um, so, so for me, you know, praying for four hours every day, I don't, I don't see how that's going to work. But what I have done, I've done different things throughout my life to be steadfast in prayer. I remember, um, you know, when I was doing Bible college stuff in Iowa, we had, a, we had an early morning prayer. This was only once a week, but it was from 6 till 7. Early morning prayer. And, and there's only a few of us, because uh, there's only a few of us <laughs> at 6 in the morning in the winter in Iowa. You know, whenever my kids go, oh, it's freezing, I'm like, you have no idea. And quite frankly, it's not freezing. It's just a little bit chilly. And like today, it's overcast. So it's not even that cold. <laughs> right? When we were going to prayer that, that 6 a.m., it was like, it was literally freezing out, right? Um, and, uh, you know, driving there, when you're driving, your car does not warm up for like 15 minutes when it's below freezing, right? And so like, by the time I got to the church, the car was not warm yet. <laughs> but anyway, but for me, in that season of my life, that's what it looked like for me to be steadfast in prayer, Right? It was like, okay, I'm going to be doing this. I'm going to dedicate this time. I'm going to go. Um, at different times, I've done just different things. You know, um, for, for a while before COVID, I, what I did every Wednesday for an hour, normally from, well, anyway, the times change. But for an hour every Wednesday morning, I would have photos of most of you uh, on A3 sheets of paper. And, uh, and I would just be, i pray for you. Now that, it's not a legalistic thing like, oh, did you do it every Wednesday? No, no, that's not the point. The point is being steadfast in prayer doesn't mean that you like, it's not an hours thing. You don't put an hour to it. But what you do is you, you create a rhythm. Yeah? Because being steadfast is about, is about having that rhythm for it. So, however God has created you, you can work with that. So for me, I go for a walk and pray. That's my best thing, right? Walking and praying is good. But Pastor Jean is like, I can't do that. I get distracted right away. I can't walk and pray, right? She has to be seated. Like, that's it for her because that's just her shape. That's how God's created her. That's just what works for her. So other people are like, oh, yeah, I just drive whenever I'm driving into work. I, I just pray. And I'm just like, when I'm driving, that does not work for me. I just can't. I just doesn't work. And that's okay, right? Because this isn't about doing it a certain way or it's not about following John Wesley's model or whatever, his method, right? As a Methodist. But, um, but it's about finding a rhythm and a shape that works for you and then just going, okay, I'm going to set this as a rhythm. This is what I'm going to do. This is how I'm going to set my time to pray. And then it's just about being steadfast in that rhythm it doesn't it's not being perfect again perfect is the enemy too right because you're not going to get perfect but it's about having a rhythm that's set up that you can be steadfast in i had a friend during that time in iowa who he was he was just like every spare moment he was praying in tongues every spare moment like all the time the guy was just always praying in tongues i was just always like wow i was encouraged by him because he did it in a way that it wasn't like, hey, this is the way you have to do it. That wasn't how, he just did it and he was just joyful in it. And it just encouraged me to pray more. And it was just, that was such a good friendship to have because he was just like such a fired up guy that when you got around him, it was just contagious, right? It wasn't, it wasn't shame or guilt or anything. When you're around him, you're just encouraged by it. Um, some people do prayer mate. Anybody got the prayer mate app? There's a prayer mate. There's a couple. 
Um, Prayer Mate is just like, it's an app that has like uh, little alarms at different times. You set your alarms and then you have these lists and it just kind of organizes your prayer, right? And it reminds you, right? It helps you set a rhythm. Now for me, I tried Prayer Mate. Didn't really work. It's okay, I have different rhythms. But for other people, Prayer Mate was really good. And they're like, this is the best thing ever. Try it, right? Because what this is about, this isn't about a, a like I said, yeah, it's, it's about setting a rhythm. And be watchful in it. Continue steadfastly in prayer. Be watchful in it. And this is just being aware of what God wants you to pray into. Be watchful. Be alert. Be aware. Be listening. You don't know how to pray as you ought, according to Romans. But you need the Holy Spirit to even direct your prayer. And so it's about being watchful in it. Knowing, um, knowing the heart of God for something. Um, just being watchful in it. With thanksgiving. Thanksgiving is a bigger thing than you think. Yeah? With our kids, sometimes there is this, uh, why does he get to do this and I don't get to do this? Why does she get to do this and I don't get to do this? You know, you know that kind of thing. Anybody have two kids? Um, <laughs> and so there's that. And, and, and what I often do is I'm just like, yeah, but think about what you get. Right? Just bring it back to being thankful for what you have. Because thankfulness is often the cure for greed. Thankfulness is the, is the cure, it's the antidote for, um, for covetousness, right? So thankfulness gets you out of a complaining cycle and, and into a gratefulness thing. I was in a negative cycle a few weeks ago now. I think I might have shared this here. Did I share that? I don't know if I shared it here. Um, I shared it in the city last week. I was in this negative kind of cycle. My, my, I would think about, okay, oh no, I don't want to think about that. Think about this, right? And then sooner or later, I'd be thinking about that again. It's just this cycle, negativity thing. And I was just like, oh man, how do I get out of this? And, um, and I found a little patch of nice weather and I had a little bit of time. Uh, and so I, I went golfing. Now for some people, golf is not a place for the fruit of the Spirit. And I understand that. <laughs> But for me, when I go golfing, it's, and when I golf alone, it's just me and the Lord, right? And I love that. And there was actually this moment, and I was in that kind of place, and there was this moment right here. I took a photo of it. Because I took a photo of it because it was the moment where I just like, finally just, ah, I was just thankful. And God brought me out of that kind of negative thing, and He brought me to this, ah, thankful. I made that putt, by the way. <laughs> just, I know a few of you were like wondering, you know, did he make that putt? That was a pretty decent putt, wasn't it? And then I was even more thankful. But I was thankful even before I made the putt because it's not about your immediate circumstances. Just like zooming out and going, God, look what you've done. This is amazing. Look what you're doing in my life. Look what you're doing in my family. Look what you're doing all around me. Oh, you are so good. Thank you. You are so good to me. And it's when you zoom out and take that big picture zoom out and you go, God, you are so good. Thankfulness. Be steadfast in it with thankfulness. And then he says this, and while you're doing that, at the same time, as you're praying, being watchful and thankful, at the same time, pray also for us that God may open a door for the Word to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I am in prison. While you're in prayer, Pray that God will open doors. Nor has the, like, the immediate thing that came to mind for me with this was, was just this whole journey with moving to Excelsior, right? It was just like the whole journey was, uh, was a door knocking exercise, right? Where we would knock on different doors, we would go and explore different buildings. Um, building relationship with other churches, like exploring what would it look like to do this not alone, but in partnership? And, and what, would, what would partnerships look like? And, and then we seemed like we were going to get there, and then it wouldn't happen. And then we were going somewhere else. Oh, no, that didn't happen. And then COVID hit, and we were like, well, good thing it didn't happen. And then we thought COVID was over, and then we were knocking on doors again and kicking down doors and trying, but they weren't opening. And then Delta happened. 
And we're like, well, kind of good thing it didn't happen. <laughs> and things would become promising and then just back away. And there was another thing. Oh, oh no. Oh, this has to be it. This has to be it. No. But when God opens the door, right? So we knock. And we can knock. We're told to knock. Ask. Seek. Right? Keep knocking. But it has to be God who opens the door. I don't know if Andy showed you any photos of Excelsior. This is the door that opened, right? The, it swung open, like crazy swung open. Um, so you, you may have heard this story, but I'm going to reiterate some of the key points. Like, uh, we went here in 2016 and had the tour. And we were told the price that it would be weekly. And we were like, yeah, not us. Hope you find somebody. You're not going <laughs> to. But the door just didn't open. We knocked. The door didn't open. Um, and then Stu met with, um, with the CEO of Excelsior, who had just given a donation to Wesley Mission, sizable donation, because Excelsior was in a very different place financially. And so, they, they, so when we walked through this time and met with the CEO, it was just me and him, and, uh, and he was basically telling me the story of Excelsior, how they went from 340 students in 2016 and about to close the doors to 1,600 students now. And that COVID had been very good to them somehow, right? And even during the pandemic, they saw amazing growth in Excelsior. And now they're at a place of not only sustainability, but growth. And, um, and they're a non-for-profit, so they're giving money away. They're just blessed. And so he said, what we want to do is we want our campus to be used for kingdom purposes seven days a week and not only six days a week. So, you can use it on Sundays and we'll, you know, we'll work out something to pay the electricity or something like that. No rent. <laughs> Just kind of a hundred a month or something like that. <laughs> it's like, what are you talking about? That's a door that swings open. That's what we're talking about here. So when you're praying and when you're steadfast in prayer with thanksgiving, pray for doors to open. That's what he says. Pray that God may open to us a door for the Word. See, this isn't a door for us to have a nice place. There's a purpose for this door. Did you hear it? Pray that God may open to us a door for the Word to declare the mystery of Christ. So this isn't, this isn't a door just for us to go, oh yeah, we can have a nice little service there and it's got nice rooms for the kids and it's got the space and we don't have to lug from a container and, and we can look at all the good things. But you know what? You know what's going to be our challenge? This is, this is going to be our challenge with it. It's not going to be to pay the rent. That's, well, we still need to break even budget. We talked about that last week. Um, our challenge with this is that we're being invited into mission with Excelsior College. This, was, this is their invitation so that their premise can, premises can be used for kingdom seven days a week. So what do we have? So what's our challenge with it? Our challenge is the stewardship of joining them in mission. They do not want a tenant. They want a partner in mission. What is that going to look like for us? How are we going to step into that? How are we going to grow into that? How are we going to steward that call? Because it's not going to be about, about you know, stewarding a, a, a lease agreement or something like that. It's going to be about stewarding this call into mission. So what does it look like to engage with a student body that is 80% uh, of a Hindu background? Right? What does it look like for us to engage with international students as well as local students? What does it look like for us to join the mission of Excelsior College? Which, if you didn't know, used to be called Wesley Institute and was birthed from Wesley Mission, has gone on its own and now is kind of having this partnership back again and partnering in mission and Andy, Elisa, and myself, we all graduated from this place. 
It's crazy. It's just God bringing everything full circle. Our challenge is going to be stepping into mission with them and doing that in a faithful way and doing that in a way that it's, that it's going to, we're going to allow it to change us and stretch us. Because on Sundays, in, 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 as I talk to the, they have a chaplain at Excelsior, and as I talk to the chaplain, we're, we're just firing ideas, right? Firing ideas about what we could do Sunday afternoons. Sunday evenings, how students could participate Sunday mornings. They're, they have a lot of like um, master students and families and, and stuff like that and how, how they can connect on Sunday. So this is going to be a challenge for us because when we see new people there, like we really need to be the people welcoming the new people, right? Because we're going we're gonna to have a lot of visitors. So how, what does it look like for us to steward this mission of God with Excelsior? Because God has flung this door wide open, but He didn't do it for your own convenience. He did it to open a door for His Word and to declare, to declare the mystery of Christ. Right? He opened this door for His purposes. I'm excited about it. When, when you see a door open like that, man, God's doing something but it's been amazing like just to see the doors that god has opened for us outside of that this is a sunday only thing right it's only sundays but um through this building relationship time with these other churches um one of the relationships that we've that i've been investing is with saint john's anglican church on cox's road north ride and um and right now on Tuesdays, fortnightly, we're, here, we're holding one of our parenting courses using their facilities. No charge. Just joining them in mission. Um, we're going to be using that uh, for other things during the week. So it's like our weekday needs are being met through this partnership. Right? So we have a, we have a space that we can meet. Um, we're looking at doing a play group even. Um, at St. John's Anglican because they've got perfect facilities for it and they've got the space and we've got the relationship and they're like, the door's wide open. So what does it look like for us to be faithful with these open doors? Right? Because God's calling us into mission in a different way than He has before. I want to encourage you as well. You know what? This, this took a while. This took a while. This, this is like six years of looking and knocking and banging and you know, if you, it, just go personal here, if you have something where you've been waiting for a breakthrough or you've been waiting for a door to open and you've been knocking at that door and you've been pounding at that door, you know what, like, there are so many instances in Scripture where it takes years of knocking before the door opens. And so I want to encourage you, if you're praying for family members, if you're praying for a, a certain breakthrough, if you're, whatever you're praying through right now, Keep knocking. Because, you know, I look back and I'm like, yeah, it didn't happen with, with this group and it didn't happen with that and it didn't happen here and it didn't happen there, but it's happening here. Like, and the big piece of this for me, which is like God's hand at work, is Elias and I, I remember, I can tell you vividly the memory of when God called Elias and I after we were just married for about six months. I was reading through Joshua. I was reading through, I, was, I had set my mind to read through the whole scriptures, right? Um, and so I was reading through Joshua. She was already asleep. I was just reading through the scriptures. And, um, and the Lord just spoke out of Joshua to me. Because we were praying about where to go. We didn't, we didn't know where we were going to be. We didn't know what God wanted for us. I was just praying through it. And I was just like, God, what, a, you know, is Sydney, you know, the place that you want us, Wesley Institute. That's where we were looking at. And, uh, and the Lord just spoke clearly to me and He said through what He said to Joshua, do not be afraid. This is where I want you to go. Every place you step your foot. And that's, at, and that's Wesley. And the word was Wesley to us. And so we were like, Wesley Institute. Wesley International Congregation. That's where, we, when we first came to Sydney, we felt called to Wesley. And so, this whole thing, when it came about, when this door flung open, it was just like, man, 
this full circle thing that God was doing. It needed the time that it took. And so I want to encourage you, if you're, if you're waiting for that thing, if you're waiting for something to happen, you're waiting, you're knocking at that door, keep knocking. Keep knocking. Because we don't see everything. We don't see everything God sees, but keep knocking. Because He will open a door. But again, it may not be for your convenience too, right? It's for His purposes, right? Open God, that God may open a door for us to declare for, for the Word to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I am in prison. So walk in wisdom toward outsiders making the best use of the time. Let your speech always be gracious or with grace. I like that translation. Season with salt so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. Let your speech always be with grace. I, I love this translation because the way that you speak should always kind of have that taste to it, that, that salted taste. It should always have that, uh, that grace to it. And last uh, couple weeks ago, I was talking about you know, how misbehavior is the perfect opportunity to show unconditional love to your kids. In fact, it's the only opportunity to show unconditional love. Um, but to respond in grace. And to realize when your first reaction is going to be negative. Right? If you know, oh man, something's just welling up inside of you. Your, your reaction is going to be negative. That's your opportunity to come in the opposite spirit. You know, I was watching the rugby last night. Anybody watch the, the Wallabies in England? Anybody watch rugby? Okay, I was watching rugby, with, and Steve was too, but that's it. And uh, anyway, so there was this moment in the match where, um, where this guy got sent off red card for, or a yellow card for pulling somebody's hair, right? He got a yellow card for that, and he's sent off. But the guy whose hair he pulled headbutted him in retaliation. So he got the red card. And the announcers, it was really interesting because I'm thinking about this stuff, you know. Um, the announcer said, you know, he got caught retaliating, but it was the first guy who instigated. So he shouldn't, you know, like, he, you know, it's only human nature that he's going to respond like that. And I was like, oh, yeah, that's right, isn't it? It's only human nature that he's going to hurt him more than he hurt him. Right? The revenge thing. That's only human nature. So he's like, oh, this retaliation, you know, this guy should get sent off too. And it's, it's like, and so they were talking about that. The point is, it's only human nature to retaliate. But what Paul is calling us to here is he's saying, be different than that. Use those opportunities. You, making the best use of the time or redeeming the time. And it's like take those moments where it's going to go negative and turn that and stop yourself, right? Just stop yourself and go, nope, that's not the way I want to go. Or if you take a few steps that way, go, oh, back up, right? I want to go this way. I'm going to stop myself. These are our opportunities. And we have multiple opportunities every day. Even while I was working on this before the rugby match last night, the kids gave me an opportunity. <laughs> okay? Another opportunity to come in the opposite spirit um, and to not go with your full first impulse. There's a really good example of this in the next few verses. But in the next few verses, it doesn't look like this is a really good example of this because this is just the list at the end of when Paul is writing this letter, Right? So Paul writes this letter at the end of all of his letters. There's, hey, these guys are with me and they're greeting you. And then these guys, uh, I want to give my greetings to these people specifically. And then there's my name there at the end. Paul writing the greeting with my own hand, remember my chains. But in here is an interesting story. It's not in Colossians. Most of it is actually in Philemon. But there's an interesting story going on here because in, in, um, he is sending this letter with Tychius. But he's sending Onesimus back too. And if you know the story of Philemon, Onesimus 
was the slave of Philemon who ran away, right? And it looks like, through Philemon, it looks like he stole from Philemon and then he took off. And he was a runaway slave. And Paul meets Onesimus in jail because he was caught as a runaway slave. And Paul meets him, brings him to Christ. He becomes a Christian. And Paul is like, Onesimus is our beloved and faithful brother who is one of you. Right? So he's from Colossae. And he's coming back with Tychicus. <laughs> um, and so he says, you know, and these are the other guys with me and everything, and this is great. But then also give my greetings to the brothers at Laodicea and to Nympha and the church in her house, because she led a house church apparently. And when this letter has been read, also say to Archippus, see that you fulfill the ministry that you've received from the Lord. Now Archippus belongs to the family of Philemon. So Philemon in the beginning of Philemon, it says uh, to Philemon and Apthia and Archippus. So they're in the same family, the same household. So Archippus could be Philemon's brother, could be his son, could be, you know, he, he's just in Philemon's household, right? So the story in between the lines here is that Paul has written to Philemon and he said, Onesimus whose name means useful, has been useless to you, but he's useful to me. And now I understand that you're leaving him in jail here, but what I want you to do is I want you to receive him back, but no longer as a slave, I want him to be your brother. <laughs> so Paul is asking Philemon to not only receive the slave that stole from him and ran away, to not only receive him back, but to receive him back and set him free from being a slave. This is what grace looks like in practice. Yeah? Because it is within Philemon's rights to go, I'm going to leave him in jail. Or it was within his rights when he comes back to beat him to death. Within his rights, right? He could do that. Or anything. He could do anything with him. He was a piece of property to him. And, and that, that could happen. So Philemon, and, and as Paul writes to him, you kind of get the sense that Philemon is kind of upset with Onesimus, right? Because Paul says to him, I could compel you. I could charge you and command you, but I won't. I want you to, I want you to choose to do this. So what Paul is doing with Philemon and Archippus here is, is exactly what he's doing with, 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 um, with these previous verses in the chapter. So chapter 3 and chapter 4, it's the same thing. He's going, you know what? You have an opportunity here to go the same way that everybody else goes because you know what? He's been your slave. He stole from you. He ran away. You can you lay down the law, you can work him extra hard, you can do all this, but actually, this is what I want you to do. I, I want you to choose this other list. <laughs> there it is. I want you to choose to put on tender mercies, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, patience, bearing with one another, and forgiveness. In a real life example, that's what he writes to Philemon. And he says to Philemon, I am going to send Onesimus back. Right? I'm going to send him back. I wish I could keep him because he's such an awesome blessing to me. But I'm going to send him back to you because this is the right thing to do. And I'm going to send him back to you and I want you to set him free. Right? But now at the end, he's got a word for Archippus. Now we don't know exactly what this word for Archippus is, but, I, but he says to Archippus, he says, see that you fulfill the ministry that you've received from the Lord. I think what he's saying is, Onesimus is one of the people I'm sending with the letter. And when he gets there, I want you to tell Archippus, Archippus, 
I want you to fulfill what the Lord gave you to do. And I think he's referring to setting Onesimus free. That's what I think. But it could be something else. Because, you know, that's all we know about Archippus, but Archippus has a life, right? He's, he's a faithful fellow soldier, as, as Paul refers to him in Philemon. He's a fellow soldier of the gospel, and he's a blessing to other people. But, and so he says, Archippus, I want you to fulfill the ministry that you've received from the Lord. And whether that's setting Onesimus free or something else, I think this is a really fascinating way to end the letter because the next verse is like, I, Paul, write this with my own hand. So this is, this is Paul going, Archippus, do what, do what God's put on your heart. Follow through with it. And I wonder if Paul was writing to the church at Ride, right? He was writing to the, the church gathered here. If he wrote a line in it where he said, and tell Uncle Joshua to fulfill the ministry that I've given him. What would that be? Right? What would it be if he said your name? And then he said, tell them to fulfill the ministry that, that they've received from the Lord. What would that look like? What would it look, I, I, and I'm sure like for Archippus, there had to be a reason, right? In my mind, I, I just play this out as Archippus. Like, like Philemon might be like, okay, yeah, let's do this. This is, this is not, it's not just the right thing. This is going beyond, yeah? So this isn't like the right thing to do could be just to receive him back and forgive him and not punish him. But Paul is saying, no, receive him back, go way beyond Make him a brother. In fact, receive him as you would receive me. And at the end of the letter, he's like, prepare a guest room for me. Right? This idea of Philemon and Archippus and Apphia preparing a guest room for Onesimus, who stole from them and ran away. Right? The scandal of grace. That's exactly what it is. Grace, what have you done? Right? This doesn't make sense. You're just going to have slaves running away all the time. <laughs> right? If they can get away with it, they're just going to, you know. Well, maybe that's okay. Right? I think Paul was a bit of an abolitionist before his day. This, this is a story of what he's been laying out in Colossians. Tell Archippus to follow through. This grace story doesn't end with Jesus being gracious to you. That's where it starts. The grace story starts with Jesus forgiving you but then, it, then that's where it begins because then you start to be conformed more into His image and the more that you live out this grace when it doesn't make sense and when people don't deserve it, of course, that's the definition of grace, like love when you don't deserve it, right? Unmerited favor. Like when, no, you don't, you don't love people who deserve it. You love people who don't. That's the story of the Gospel and that's why we're here that's why we're forgiven. And so that's our message that we have. And, and the real world outworking of this is going to be hard. It's going to be difficult for us. Sometimes it's going to be so against the grain of what we want to do. And it's going to be against the grain of our culture. But that's what God calls you to do. And that's why when your child disobeys, that's your opportunity to show unmerited favor. Right. That's why when a colleague is complaining, you come in the opposite spirit and you come with thankfulness and you make their head turn and go, whoa. That's how you shine like a star in the universe, right? Because that's what God does for us. Paul isn't just saying, hey, look, do this because I think it, you should. He's saying, no, do this because this is the example that Christ gave for us. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. 
But it's not just at the cross, too. It's when Jesus calls Zacchaeus. The whole world had given up on Zacchaeus. Jesus hadn't. It's Mary Magdalene who he casts out seven demons and then makes her the, the um, messenger of the resurrection. It's all 12 of his 12 disciples. It's Saul, Paul, right? This is the story of redemption. That in the middle of our disobedience, God says, I love you and I can't stop loving you and I'm going to keep loving you because I didn't come for the sick, I came for, or didn't come for the healthy, I came for the sick. My love's unconditional because God's love always goes first. Our focus in the upcoming years, and Stu has really helped us to kind of refocus and re, you know, galvanize our focus and everything. Our focus in the next years is going to be how do we equip you to bring this message to people who aren't going to come to church? Because this old model of just bring your friends to church and they'll become a Christian, yeah, that was great, but you know what? There are people who aren't coming. It's true. They're just not coming. You can invite them till the cows come home. They're not coming. But you can disciple them toward faith in Christ. Even without them coming to church. You can't. You have the Holy Spirit in you. You have the Word of God. You have all you need to disciple someone towards faith. And so then the next few years, what you're going to see is this thing that's going to roll out in our church. In, within the whole of Wesley Mission, we're going to see a focus of empowering people. And this is what the young adult camp is about, right? The moldable young adults, right? We're going to mold them first, right? Well, that's what the camp's about. It's about empowering people so that they can start discipling people before people come to church. Because it's great when they do come to church, but a lot of people just aren't there yet. But you know what? They are there. You know what? I, they, I believe that there are a lot of people who would be ready to read the Bible if you just go, you know, I'm looking for somebody to read the Bible with and I wonder if you might be interested. I think there's a lot of people out there who are hungry for God and they don't, and the, and the Bible is appealing in that sense. And they're like, all right, yeah. Now, I, I really think that the more we, we, we see this and the more we um, empower people toward this, so that that's not a scary thing, um, the more we're going to see people who will eventually come to church. Right? But the goal is to disciple people toward faith in Christ. That's the goal. So whether they come to this church or not, to me, as long as they're discipled toward faith in Christ, they can go to BSF, they can go to whatever else. Yeah, I don't care. They don't have to come to our church. They can go to another church. But if we're discipling them toward faith in Christ, then that's us being faithful with the mission of God. And that starts, it starts with us showing grace when it's not expected. That's the biblical model. That's how Jesus did it. Our next series next week is going to be about making disciples as Jesus did um, through the words, through us walking. I've got to slow down. Walking in the words, ways, and works of Jesus. That'll be next week. Um, and we're going to start that series. But uh, God's calling us to be conformed more into His image. He's calling us to walk out His mission. Us stewarding that call is going to be the most important thing. Knowing that it's His grace that went first, and now we show that same grace. Let's pray. Let's pray. Father, we thank You, God. We thank You, God, that You went first, Lord. That the scandal of grace, You died in our place so that our soul would live. And Lord, we thank You, God, that You are at work in our hearts, Lord, that, that Christ in us is the hope of glory, that You are calling us to, to, um, to walk with tender mercies toward others, showing grace to people who we wouldn't even think to show grace to before. 
Not looking for somebody who's worthy of grace, but looking for somebody unworthy of grace. Father, I pray that You would put words on our mouths, God. Put a fire in our hearts, Lord. That You would show us who and how to show grace, to show love. And Lord, we thank You for Your love for us that always goes first. We thank You that You came for the sick. We thank You that You came for us. And Lord, help us be messengers of Your resurrection, of Your grace. In Jesus' name, Amen. I forgot right. Your soul training. Hold on. I forgot Your soul training. Your soul training is simply this. Look for it. Look for those opportunities to show grace to somebody who doesn't deserve it. Look for it. Eyes open. That's it.